So thank you very much for having me. Um, it's great to do these uh, virtual meetups now because that means that I can uh, be at events like this where I usually I wouldn't be able to go to this uh, type of stuff because it would require travel. But now I can just uh, do these talks all around the world just from my table right here <laughs> from home, which is awesome. You know, there are, there are certain advantages to the pandemic. So, oh, just a second. I'm unscrewing my microphone here. That's not uh, how it should be. All right, I'm just not going to touch it anymore. So, hi, I'm Barry. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Azure Barry, and I'm a Pluralsight author and also a developer and uh, an architect. And today, I want to talk to you about Azure, of all things, and about uh, how to pick the right services in Azure for your solution. There we go. I also have a podcast that I've uh, created and that's just released. The second episode's up now and tomorrow I will release uh, the third episode, which is actually about Azure, the next upcoming episode. And that is about uh, keeping up with Azure with uh, Tim Warner, tech trainer, trainer Tim. You can check out the podcast at the link that you see right here. Please check it out. And of course, you can find me on Pluralsight as well. I've created lots of courses about Azure but also about other stuff like HTML, WebAssembly, Blazor, JavaScript, you name it. And about the topic that we're talking about today, which is Microsoft Azure for developers, what to use when, which is all about how to pick the right services for your Azure solution. Now, why are we even talking about this? Well, Microsoft Azure is huge, as you know, it has 150 plus services or something to pick from. It changes all the time. Uh, new services come out and existing services get new features or features get uh, deprecated. So this makes it all very, very difficult to actually pick the right service for your solution. Because, you know, let's say you want to run an application in Azure, you have a dozen options. Which one are you gonna pick? Today, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about a couple of categories of um, things that you can choose in Azure. We're gonna start with how to run your application in Azure. We're gonna see which services are, are available for that scenario and how to pick uh, the right services for that. We're also gonna take a look at how to store your data in Azure. After that, we'll take a look at how to speed up your applications in Azure and then how to monitor your applications in Azure. So let's start with running applications in Azure. So what I do when I want to uh, assess which Azure service I'm gonna use for running an application in Azure, I start by asking a couple of big picture questions. Now the first one is how much control do I need? How much control does my application need in this case? Do I need full control over the operating system that it runs on? or can I just let Azure do all that stuff? Do I need control over scaling or can I let Azure do that stuff? Next question is, where do I need my app to run? Is that only in Azure or is that also on-premises for instance, or maybe also in another cloud like AWS? Because that also determines uh, which services I can use. The next question is, oh, let me just put this away. What usage model do I need? As in, does my application need to run 24 seven, seven days uh, or 24 hours, seven days a week? Or is it a serverless thing that only needs to run whenever you need it and whenever it is used? And then finally, when I've answered these three big questions, then I can take a look at the actual functionality that I need and then compare the services based on that. Now, I'm only going to go into the function, functional uh, characteristics of Azure services in this case. And I'm going to leave things like performance and costs and availability out of the equation because that makes it way too difficult, obviously, for what we're talking about today. But these guidelines that we're talking about in this uh, presentation will give you a handle on how to pick the right services for your solution. Now, let's take a look at that first big picture question. How much control do I need? 
And this is a question about control and responsibility versus working on business value. Now, there's a spectrum in this, as in you start with infrastructure as a service, the thing on the right, on, on the left, I'm sorry. And in that case, with infrastructure as a service, you have the most control and responsibility, as in you have control over the network, over antivirus that you need to run maybe on your virtual machine. You also have control over your operating system, server configuration, everything up to your application configuration. But that also means that you have responsibility over all those things. So that means that you are responsible for patching the operating system and making sure that it's secure and patching the antivirus that might be running and also even um, responsible for the network that it's running on. You can obviously do that, but it, it should be a conscious choice and your app might need that type of control. If you go up the spectrum, you get less control and also less responsibilities. So with platform as a service, the next one, you have less responsibilities, as in you don't have to think about the operating system anymore, but you think about the server configuration, as in do you run it 32-bit, uh, 64-bit, or in case of an app service, let's say maybe you want uh, HTTP2 enabled, uh, SSL, things like that, and obviously the application and the app configuration. And even further up the stack, you have LAS, which I call logic as a service, or serverless, there the uh, Azure scales for you. So the server configuration also goes away a little bit. And then you are kind of only responsible for your application, which you deploy and you just let Azure handle the rest. And all the way up there is software as a service. And in that case, you don't even have to deploy the application because that is already there. You just use it and you just can configure it. So, uh, the question here is how much control do you actually need? If you can determine that, you can determine uh, where you fall within the spectrum of control and responsibility versus working on business value. Now, the next question is, where do I need my app to run? As in, is that only in Azure, in the public cloud, or in Azure government, or in uh, Azure Stack, for instance? Or do you also need to run it somewhere else? Could be that you have to run it on premises as well, or also on your local development computer, of course, and or in other clouds. Could be that you want a multi-cloud deployment. M many large companies do nowadays where they have solutions that they deploy to Azure, but also to AWS, for instance, not Google sometimes, <laughs> but uh, usually it's uh, Azure and AWS. So this is also a question that you need to ask yourself because it determines the type of services that you can use. We'll take a look at what that looks like in a bit. And then the next big picture question is what usage model do I need? As in how will my application be used? Is that all the time? As in uh, uh, I have a website, uh, a web shop, let's say, that is open uh, day and night, seven days a week. So it will be used all the time. In that case, you will use the classic model, the classic hosting model, which is always on. It runs all the time. It's a web server. It's an app service, for instance. In Azure, is an Azure app service web app, for instance, that works for that. And you pay for that all month. Now, if, you, if your app is only used occasionally, let's say it's a, it's a web service or just some batch job that uh, takes in an image and resizes it whenever it comes in, then you would use a serverless hosting model, which is different because that only runs when you need it. And with that, you don't pay all month, but you pay per execution. You only pay when it actually runs. So that's different. Now, once you have all these questions answered, you can take a look at the functionality. Now, here is an example of answering these three questions, as in, I trust Azure to scale for me. So that means I fall in the logic as a service spectrum and my app needs to run in Azure and also on premises. And my app only needs to run once every hour. So it falls in the serverless spectrum. Now with that in mind, let's take a look at all the options that we actually have to run our application in Azure. There are a lot of options and this is not actually the complete list to do that, but this is all developer focused. So let's take a look. We have virtual machines in which you have a lot of control, obviously. You have container instances, which you can use to run single containers. 
and you can use an orchestrator, but you don't have to. There's Azure Kubernetes service in which you also run containers, but then in an orchestrator, Kubernetes in this case, there is web app for containers, Azure App Services web app for containers, in which you also run an, uh, a container, but then in an Azure App Services web app, and we're gonna take a look at what that means in a second. There's Azure Batch, which you can use to run uh, jobs, like uh, rendering a movie file, for instance, and scale those out over multiple compute nodes. There's Azure Service Fabric, which you can use to uh, um, run services reliably and also run microservice uh, solutions. There's Azure Cloud Services, which is one of the original services in Azure. It's very old. It was one of the first platform as a service services in any cloud. You, sh you shouldn't use it anymore because it's super old, but it still exists and you can use it to uh, run web applications in and also background processes in. There's Azure App Services Web Apps, which you can use to run web applications in. There's Azure App Services mobile apps, which you can use mobile uh, to host mobile backends in. There's Azure Functions, which run uh, tiny pieces of code in a serverless way. And there's Azure Logic App, which you can use to orchestrate a process of multiple steps. So those are a lot of options that you have to run your application in Azure. Now, if we look at the spectrum of control versus worker on business value, these services, so virtual machines, container instances, Kubernetes service, web app for containers, batch, and also partly Azure service fabric fall in the spectrum of infrastructure as a service. As in, you have a lot of control over these. You have control over the operating system, also responsibility over the operating system. Um, yeah, you have a lot of control over these. Services that fall in the platform as a service uh, spectrum are cloud services, like I said, web apps, and also mobile apps, and, and also partly and service fabric. Audits, so these are what was that? I didn't catch that. Somebody entered the room uh, okay. unmuted. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. That's fine. I thought it was uh, might might have been a question. So cloud services, mobile apps, web apps, and service fabric fall into the spectrum of platform as a service. These services uh, run on Azure and you don't have to worry about the operating system because Azure takes care of all that stuff. And then logic apps and also Azure functions fall into the logic as a service or serverless um, spectrum. You can run functions also as a platform as a service on an app service uh, plan, but you can also run it as a serverless server service. And Logic Apps also runs serverless, as in you don't have to worry about scaling it even, Azure does all that stuff for you. So control and responsibility versus working on business value. Now, if you want to stay vendor agnostic, as in you want your application to be able to run anywhere in Azure, but also on-premises and maybe in other clouds, then these services are suitable for that scenario. I say virtual machines in this case as well, because you can create images for virtual machines and run those basically in any cloud and also on-premises. Also the uh, container services, so container instances, Kubernetes, web apps for containers and service fabric, because Azure Service Fabric also runs containers and has its own container orchestrator, because containers can run anywhere, can on, run on your local machine, they can run in Azure, they can run in Azure Stack, they can run in AWS, wherever you want. Also Azure Batch can run anywhere because Azure Batch also can run uh, a job in a container or on a virtual machine. And finally, also Azure Functions can run anywhere with the Azure Functions runtime, which you can install in a container, for instance, and run that anywhere, or you can install that on your local machine and run it. If you want to run your app uh, occasionally, so only sometimes and not 24 seven serverless, then these services are good for that. Also Azure Batch in this case, so not only Logic Apps and Azure Functions, but also Azure Batch, because Batch can take care of the scaling for you. So it does that automatically, it fans out its compute nodes of containers or virtual machines to scale up the processing of that tasks like rendering a movie and then scale it back down, shut it down when it, when it is done. Now let's compare these services based on functionality. 
And we'll start by comparing the options for containers and virtual machines. So we have virtual machines, container instances, Kubernetes service, web app for container, batch service fabric. Now, if you want to lift and shift your application to the cloud, as in you don't do anything to your application, you just want to put it in the cloud, then a virtual machine is very suited for that because you can just install, let's say, a Windows Server image on that, use a virtual machine for that, and just install your service on that uh, virtual machine, just like you have it now on premises. If you want to run a simple application in a container without an orchestrator, then, or uh, in a virtual machine, you can use a virtual machine for that, for a simple application. But also if you want to run it in a container in Azure Container Instances, because that's suited for running single containers, possibly without an orchestrator. If you want to run complex applications with an orchestrator, as in multiple containers that talk to each other and that need to be spun up and spun down, then you would use Azure Kubernetes Service, which is a container orchestrator, Kubernetes. But also you can use Service Fabric because it comes with its own uh, container orchestrator. If you want to run orchestrated microservices, then Service Fabric is most suited for that, as in it is marketed to actually do that. You can also do that on Kubernetes, where you would then run your microservices in containers, which are then orchestrated by Kubernetes. But Service Fabric is more suited for microservices, I feel, because it, uh, it has also the programming model for things like Akka.net. If you want to run an application anywhere, then you can also use Service Fabric because you can use the Service Fabric runtime and install that anywhere. You can run that in Azure. You can also install the Service Fabric runtime on your local machine or on-premises in another cloud. It just works. And if you want to run a web app on Windows or Linux with app service features in a container, then you would use Web App for Containers which can host a container in Windows or Linux, and it can then use app service features like deployment slots and easy authentication and authorization. And if you want to run repetitive jobs on massive scale, like for instance, the um, rendering of a large movie file, then you would use Azure Batch. All right, now let's compare um, the services to run background tasks. We have the cloud services, web jobs, functions, batch, and that's it. <laughs> so if you want to run short running tasks, then you could use cloud services for that, web jobs, functions, and also Azure Batch. If you want to run long running tasks, you can use cloud services, web jobs, functions, and batch. So all these services are suited for long running tasks and short running tasks, including Azure Functions because Azure Functions, even in a serverless model, um, a serverless hosting mode, can run long running tasks, as in you can configure it to run tasks that are, let's say 10 minutes. But now you have also uh, the premium pricing tier, which allows you to run even longer tasks in a serverless mode. If you want to run a particularly resource intensive task, like the rendering of a movie file, you would choose Azure Batch. If you want to pay all month for running your service, you use cloud services and web jobs because these uh, operate in, uh, in a platform as a service way where a cloud service is on all the time. You deploy your web application to that or your background task in this case, and it just runs all the time. A web job does exactly the same thing. It runs on, runs on an app service uh, plan, Azure app service plan and runs 24 seven. If you want to only pay for what and when you run it, then Azure Functions is very suited for that in a serverless mode, of course, as in you deploy your little code, the snippet of code to there that executes uh, something and it only runs when you need it and you only pay for it when you need it. And if you need, need to deploy a complete application with all the plumbing and all the bells and whistles uh, in order for it to run, then you could use cloud services and also Azure Batch because these um, require you to use sort of a template, a uh, project template that uh, involves some extra plumbing in order for it to be able to run in these particular services. 
But if you only want to deploy the code that is necessary to run, you would use a web job or Azure Functions. Yes, an Azure Function does come in a little template thingy if you create one, but basically you don't have to worry about that. It's just a little bit that code that you do there, or you can even paste that code in the Azure portal if you use that uh, editor, and then it just runs. And the same goes for web jobs. All right, so let's compare where to run your applications. That is Azure Web App, Mobile App, Cloud Services, Service Fabric, Azure Functions, and Azure Logic Apps. If you want to host a web application, you would do that with an Azure App Services web app. And you can also use Azure Cloud Services. Like I said, these are very old. The original services in Azure, the original platform as a service services in Azure, you shouldn't use those anymore because web apps are basically uh, the evolution of cloud services and the next gen of them. There are still available cloud services because you know there are still customers using it, so they can't just turn it off. But just don't use that anymore. You can also use Service Fabric because you basically can run any type of application in Azure Service Fabric. If you want to host your own APIs, you can use Azure Web Apps, Cloud Services, and Service Fabric, and also Azure Functions. Now you might notice that there's no API apps on here, Azure, as in Azure App Services API apps, which existed previously. They did exist previously, but now they're gone. Uh, I once asked uh, the uh, development engineering team of Azure why Azure App Services API apps existed, because they had the exact same features as Azure Web Apps. And they said, well, because it's just a, uh, a different icon that you can use in the portal so that you can recognize that this app is an API instead of a web app. So they phased that out and it doesn't exist anymore. So if you want to host an API, you can use an Azure web app, also cloud service, also service fabric, and also Azure functions, because Azure functions also allows you to create an API proxy in front of it, uh, which then means that your cloud service, which can be an HTTP triggered thing, is basically an API. If you want to host a backend for mobile applications that does additional things like enabling uh, offline working, then you can use Azure mobile apps. And if you want to automate one step of a complete process, you would use an Azure function because that is perfectly suited to run just one, uh, one distinct discrete step of a process, like for instance, processing an image or resizing an image. And if you want to automate a complete process, you would use Azure Logic Apps, which can call a bunch of Azure Functions or other APIs to complete a complete process. If you want to enjoy features like deployment slots and easy authentication, you would use the Azure App Services, as in web apps, mobile apps, but also, uh, oh, and Azure Functions because Azure Functions is also part of uh, Azure App Services, but also Azure Cloud Services, because Cloud Services also has deployment slots in a rudimentary way. And if you want to run microservices at massive scale, you would use Service Fabric, just like we saw this before. Service Fabric is perfectly suited for running microservices, but you can also use Azure Functions for this scenario. You could. I, I've seen people do it. I don't know if it's a good idea, <laughs> but you can definitely do it. And then all those microservices would run serverless in an Azure function. All right. So those were the options for running an application in Azure. Now we'll move on to storing your data in Azure. Again, we ask a couple of big picture questions to filter out the services, and then we move on to functionality. So the first question is, what will I use the data for? And the second question is, what type of data am I going to store? As in, is it relational data or is it something else? And then we're going to take a look at the functionality and compare services based on that. Now, the first question is, what will I use the data for? Is that for your application, your forms over data application, where you would use OLTP or online transactional processing, so you would submit data and you would read it out and you would use that data regularly, read and write data a lot. 
or would you use it for data analytics? As in, you put a lot of data into a data store and then you use an analytics suite like um, data where, <laughs> uh, I can't even think of it. There's lots of options in Azure. I'll come to that in a second. And that's called OLAP or online and analytical processing. So this is the question here. What will you use the data for? If you answer this question, you can already um, uh, choose between a lot of the options for storing your data. The second question is what type of data am I going to store? And this is the question of, are you going to store relational data as in tables with rows and columns or unstructured data, which can be a lot of things like uh, document data or key value data, graph data, lots of other stuff, just uh, images and uh, videos. Now, here is the example again for an answer to these questions. As in, my application is an online reservation system, which means that it's basically forms over data. So I will use OLTP services. And my app needs to store and retrieve document data, which is non-relational data. Now, here are all the options for storing data in Azure. Again, there are a lot of options. Azure is huge. So they have options for all sorts of scenarios and all sorts of people that want to use it because they want everybody to use their cloud. That's why they have all these options. So we have Azure SQL database, which is SQL server in the cloud. Azure databases for MySQL, Azure databases for PostgreSQL, Azure databases for MariaDB, which are these type of open sources databases in the cloud. There's Azure Cosmos DB, which is a uh, multi-mode cloud database in which you can put data in and you can talk to it in uh, multiple APIs. For instance, you can use the MongoDB API or a SQL API or a graph API in the form of Gremlin. There's also Azure Storage, which consists out of Azure File Storage, which you can use to store files. Azure Queues, which is also a type of storage, but also a queue, as in you store small messages in there that can be picked up and processed by other applications. There's Azure Blob Storage, in which you store bigger files, blobs of data. And there's Azure Table Storage, which is kind of a table with rows and columns, although the columns aren't set, as in uh, one row can have 10 columns and the other uh, row can have two columns. It's very uh, different and there's no relationship between the data. And then there's Azure Disk Storage, which you use in virtual machines. And then there's also Azure Synapse Analytics, which was Azure SQL Data Warehouse, but they just renamed it. And I think that it has a couple more capabilities now. And there's also Azure Data Lake Store. Now, how are we gonna choose between all these services? First, we divide them between OLTP, as in Forms Over Data Online Transactional Processing Services, and Online Analytical Processing Services, OLAP services, which are the bottom ones, Azure Synapse Analytics and Azure Data Lake Store. And then the next uh, divide is the type of data. So Azure SQL Database, and MySQL, PostgreSQL, and MariaDB are all data stores for relational data, as in tables with rows and columns. Azure Cosmos DB and all the Azure storage ones, including Azure Table Storage, are all unstructured and document data. And data analytics um, is a mix between relational and unstructured data, but is meant for larger data, so a large amounts of data. Now let's compare these and let's start by comparing data stores for OLTP, so for forms over data. We have Azure SQL Database, MySQL, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, Cosmos DB, and I've uh, categorized all the Azure storage services under one thing because there are so many of them. <laughs> so when you want to store relational data, you would choose SQL, MySQL, PostgreSQL, or MariaDB. If you want to store semi or non-relational data, you would use Cosmos DB or one of the Azure storage services. If you want to use Microsoft tools to manage your data, then you would use Azure SQL or Cosmos DB or Azure storage. If you want to use, uh, and if you want to use uh, open source tools, those come with the MySQL, uh, PostgreSQL and MariaDB. So it's just, uh, a choice between SQL and MySQL, for instance, 
It's just where you come from. If you're used to MySQL and if your company is using that, you can just use that instead of SQL and the other way around as well. If you want advanced querying capabilities, you would use Azure SQL, which obviously does SQL and therefore advanced querying capabilities. Also MySQL, PostgreSQL and MariaDB and Cosmos DB as well. And if you want to use multiple APIs to access data, like I just said, you can use Cosmos DB for that, as in you store data in Cosmos DB and can access that with multiple types of APIs, like a MongoDB API, Graph API, and a SQL API, and there are a couple more. Now let's compare the data stores for OLAP. So the data analytical stores. We have Azure Synapse Analytics, which is the new name for Azure SQL Data Warehouse and Azure Data Lake Store. Now, if you want to store relational data in one of these stores, you would use Azure Synapse Analytics because it's a big data data store in which you have rows and tables and columns. Also Azure Data Lake Store because you can basically store any type of data in Azure Data Lake. If you want to store non-relational data, you would choose Azure Data Lake Store. This store requires you to define a data schema upfront before you put data in there. That is the Azure Synapse Analytics because it requires you to create the schema with tables and rows and columns. And Azure Data Lake Store doesn't. You can just put your data in there willy-nilly and then sort it out later. If you want a data store that has no file or database size limits, as in no limits until uh, your credit card is, uh, is done, then you would choose Azure Data Lake Store. There's always a limit in Azure and it's, uh, it's always the credit card uh, eventually if there is no service limits. And if you want to um, know which questions the data should answer, then you would choose Azure Synapse Analytics because it requires you to define the data schema upfront as in you need to think about which questions you want the data to answer upfront. And if you don't know the answers that you want the data to uh, answer, then you would use Azure Data Lake Store, as in you have a bunch of data and you don't know if there's any value in there, potentially. You would use Azure Data Lake Store. All right. Let's move on to the next category, which is um, how- Sorry, yep. sorry to interrupt, Barry. Uh, we've had a couple of storage related questions that I thought now would be a good time to bring up. So we had one from Hamza towards the start of the talk um, around, can you please explain the difference between LTR backup and block bulb storage um, archive tier? And if that doesn't uh, make sense, we can always take it again at the end of the uh, talk when the mics are on. Yeah. So. Uh, Let's, uh, let's see if I understand that correctly. Between long-term uh, storage retention? Yes. Blob storage? Yeah, blob, blob storage, um, archive tier. Um, oh. And if that, doesn't, if that doesn't make sense in context, again, we can have the mics on at the end and we'll probably be able to get a better understanding of what the question is. No, no, that's fine. Um, I'm not familiar with the LTR uh, that much. I do use uh, blob storage uh, archive tier, though. And what I know from that is that it is uh, pretty slow uh, in this case, but it's also pretty cheap. And I don't know it, what the performance, for instance, is for LTR in that case uh, versus the costs there. So I can't really make a good comparison. Cool. And uh, we've had one from John as well, um, which I don't know if you've already covered off just uh, in the previous slide, but um, are there any questions to distinguish between Azure AS and Synapse? Azure okay. AS? In, what do you mean? I, I don't know if that was a typo. <laughs> so I'm just reading, reading it as it comes. I was hoping that would mean something to you. But again, if it doesn't make sense, we can always take it at the end. Uh, or if John can type quick enough and clarify that question. <laughs> can you see the chat, by the way? Uh, I probably can. <laughs> I just it, I minimized everything so that I can just see my slides, of course. Apologies. Um, oh, Azure, oh, yeah, Azure Analysis Services, brackets, tabular engine. Oh, let's see. Yeah, th there we go. All right. Yeah, Azure Analyst, uh, Analytic, uh, Azure Analytics Services, which is basically uh, uh, analytics services, but then in the cloud. Uh, 
Well, it is very different from Synapse Analytics, as in uh, SQL Data Warehouse, as in uh, SQL Data Warehouse is only a data store. It's not an analytical engine, where Azure um, Analytics Service <laughs> is an analytics engine, but it is also a data store. So you can also store models in there of data and then analyze them with the tools of the Azure Analysis Services. That is, that's it, Azure Analysis Services. <laughs> But you cannot do that with Azure uh, Synapse Analytics. So you need an additional um, analytical service for that. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, still part of OLAP functionality, you say, yeah. Does that answer your question actually? If you can type it. Okay, cool. <laughs> See, we're live, we're, it's all live. How cool is that? All right, uh, were there more questions? I think you've covered them all off. Um, but yeah, I'll right. keep an eye on the chat and try at the end of each. I'll come back to that uh, later because yes. we have time. Cool. So let's move on to the next category, which is how to choose Azure services to speed up your application. I promise this is gonna be uh, less long <laughs> than the previous ones because there's less options. So options for speeding your apps up in Azure. These are the options. We have Azure Content Delivery Network, which is what it sounds like, as in um, you put your uh, static files in the Azure CDN in a storage that has access to Azure CDN and Azure CDN propagates all those files to its points of presence around the world, making it so that it uh, uh, speeds up your application. We'll see how that works in a second. There's Azure Cache for Redis, which was Azure Redis Cache. I hate these uh, marketing naming changes. I actually had a course, it was called Azure Redis Cache something something. I had to rename all the instances where I said Azure Redis Cache to Azure Cache for Redis. It's just horrible, <laughs> just because they changed the name. Uh, anyways, this is an in-memory key value pair and also just data cache. There's Azure Traffic Manager, which you can use to route uh, global traffic to your application. And there's Azure Front Door, which kind of does the same, as in you put Front Door in front of your application, literally, it can live on the edge of Azure, as they say, on the edge. And then traffic hits Front Door first, and then it gets um, Front Door, moves it to your application, and you can put uh, rules in place where it uh, sends your traffic, and it can accelerate your traffic as well because Azure, CDN, uh, Azure Front Door also contains a small CDN and a couple of uh, nifty tricks that uh, speed up your traffic. It also comes with uh, a web application firewall, at least you can enable and pay for that, which then makes your traffic uh, more secure as in it can detect SQL injection attacks and things like that. So here are the questions, the big picture questions to ask for this category. Are my users globally distributed? As in, um, is my application used from multiple geographical regions in the world? Does my application use data that is used a lot, but doesn't change often? And does my application use audio, vim video, or images, or other static files? Let's see the first one. Are my users globally distributed? Well, if that's not the case, then we stop here, but you can use other services like Azure, uh, Redis Cache to speed up your application, which we'll see in a bit. But if that is the case, then we ask the question, is the traffic between users and the application HTTP based, or is it something else like a TCP? If it is HTTP based, then we can use Azure Front Door, because Azure Front Door works with HTTP and HTTPS, not yet with uh, TCP and other protocols. And if it isn't HTTP based, or if it is DNS, then you would use Azure Traffic Manager to route geographically uh, um, distributed users to your application. And additionally to these techniques, as in front door and uh, Traffic Manager, you can use Azure CDN and also Redis Cache to speed up your application. Now, this next question is, does my application use data that is used a lot and doesn't change often? 
Now, this is an example of um, data that changes often and is also used a lot. So this does change often. It is order data. So users write new orders, they modify orders and orders might get uh, deleted or changed in status. And this here is data that is changed little, but also used often potentially, a list of uh, countries that might show up in a form that uh, people need to fill in. So each time the form is presented, this list gets um, called up from the database, let's say, or another storage uh, thing. Um, and then this type of data, data that changes little, but is used often, is a perfect candidate to put into Azure Cache for Redis, as in, in an a cache instead of in a database. Now, why is that? Because Azure Cache for Redis is an in-memory data store for optimal speed, which means that if you uh, get data from this instead of, let's say, from uh, Azure SQL, you don't have to perform a whole query where it traverses tables potentially, maybe it does a join here or there, uh, reads an index. It doesn't have to do any of that. It just takes a look at uh, the data that is in the key that you ask for, and then it just presents that in memory, which is very, very fast, faster than SQL can do. Although SQL can also be very fast and can have in-memory tables, you would still need to perform a query. Azure Cache for Redis also comes with advanced features like geo-replication, where it can replicate the um, data that is in the cache all over the world so that all that data is also close to your users where it minimizes latency. And it has a data persistence feature where the data that's in there, you can persist that to disk or to another storage uh, place. Then the final question here is, does my application use audio, video, or images, or other static files? Now, here's an example. If you have a website runs in, uh, let's say, uh, a web app, and you have some static files, like uh, audio and video, some JavaScript files, some CSS files, that's all fine. Especially when users use it that are geographically close to you, that works pretty well. But you might also have users that are further away that also use the application, which is fine, but then it will be slower for them. And that is because of latency. And latency, what that is, is basically the time that it takes for uh, uh, network traffic to travel over the network. Now, this all goes at the speed of light, but still your signal has to go through routers and hops, and it might even bounce off the earth to a satellite and back. And that just all takes time. This all just takes time. Not that much time, it's just milliseconds, but still it takes time. But you might think, well, these milliseconds, who cares? But this adds up, latency adds up. Let's say I have a website and I have an average of 10 requests that are all not in parallel, but in sequence, and they would all have a latency of 173 milliseconds that would add up to 1.7 seconds of latency added up to your page load time, which is a lot. You don't want that. So what can we do? Well, we can put those static files, those video files, those JavaScript and CSS files into the CDN. And the CDN, Content Delivery Network, then um, uploads those files to its points of presence all over the world. So pop, CDN pop. And it has lots of points of presence all over the world. And there are more points of presence a lot more than there are Azure data centers, which means that there is always a point of presence that is close to your users. And this means that you get rid of that latency for these um, files, because these files get pulled from close by geographically instead of from far away. An additional uh, benefit of using the CDN is that your browser that opens the website and downloads these files now downloads them from the CDN and no longer from your website from your servers or from your Azure web app, which means that you free up CPU cycles to do other stuff because the CDN has to serve those files up to the browser and to your users. Now, how does that work, Azure CDN? Well, you create an Azure CDN endpoint and then you put your files into storage like Azure Blob Storage, for instance. You can also put them somewhere else. And then you connect that Azure Blob Storage to your Azure CDN endpoint, and CDN will then populate the, its uh, points of presence with um, the contents 
of that blob storage. And then in your website, where you point to those files, let's say it's an image, you simply point to another URL, the URL of the CDN, like website.azureedge.net slash cookie in this case. That's all you have to do to make that work. Very simple, but very effective. Now let's compare these services to each other. We have CDN, we have Redis Cache, we have Traffic Manager, and we have Front Door. If you want to offload traffic from your application, then you can use CDN, like we just talked about, where the CDN serves up those images and static files so that your web server doesn't have to. You can also use Redis Cache, which kind of does the same, but then in an external cache, and also Azure Front Door, because Azure Front Door also contains a small cache. Uh, a small CDN, sorry. If you want to bring your data close to your users, then you would also use CDN like we just saw. Redis Cache can do the same with this geo-replication feature and Front Door as well because it contains a CDN. If you want to bring your application closer to your users, you would use Azure Traffic Manager or Azure Front Door because both these services can route geographically distributed traffic to your application, as in, they both stand in front of your application and receive the requests from users and can determine uh, which application instance is closest to that user and route the user to it. If you want to provide fast in-memory access to data, well, guess what? Then you can use Azure Redis Cache, or no, Azure Cache for Redis, that's what it is. All right. Now we move on to the final category, which is how to choose Azure services to monitor your application. So these are the options for monitoring applications in Azure. We have Azure Application Insights, which you use to monitor web applications typically. You can also monitor desktop applications with it, although Microsoft doesn't uh, advertise or market that, but you can do that. There's Azure, Azure there's not Azure, Visual Studio App Center, which you use to um, uh, deploy tests, but also monitor your uh, applications that run on mobile devices with. There's Azure Log Analytics, which you can plug into services like Azure SQL, for instance, and then uh, it starts to uh, aggregate those logs, which you can then analyze later. There's also Azure Network Watcher, which uh, can uh, monitor and analyze network traffic. There's Azure Monitor, which is a service that can um, aggregate other logs like Azure Log Analytics and also Azure Application Insights and query amongst those. There's Azure Security Center, which is an overall service, which uh, shows you the security state of your subscription, let's say, and shows you actionable insights. And Azure Advisor, which provides you advice about security, performance, and costs, as in, uh, well, hey, this VM uh, is a bit big, maybe you can scale it down. Now, these services, Azure Application Insights, Visual Studio App Center, and Azure Log Analytics, are all monitoring services for the application level. As in Azure Application Insights, you can use it to monitor one application. And these services, Azure Network Watcher, Monitor, Security Center, and Advisor, are all monitoring services on the subscription level. So these are more aggregation services and higher level services. Now let's compare these, which is relatively simple because all these services have very specific um, functionality. So if you want to monitor a web or desktop application, you can use Application Insights. If you want to monitor a mobile application, you should use Visual Studio App Center. If you want to monitor a component of an application, you could use Azure Log Analytics. And if you want to inspect network traffic to diagnose problems, so network traffic, you would use Network Watcher. It's very predictable, this slide. If you want to get an overview of all monitoring data, you would use Azure Monitor. And if you want to get an overview of all security aspects, you would use Security Center. Now, I'll bet you, you couldn't guess what this, uh, where this is going. Get an overview of actionable recommendations. Yep, it is <laughs> Azure Advisor. All right. So these were all the service categories that we'll cover today on how to pick it. 
before we go into uh, more questions, let me just um, go through the last slides as in how to stay up to date with Azure. Now what I use is Azure Architecture Center, which contains uh, reference architectures uh, and other uh, very good resources. It's on Microsoft Docs. Azure Friday, which are short videos with Scott Henselman, which uh, you can see on uh, Thursday, I think. Um, but Azure Friday, um, you usually see a, a video of um, somebody in the Azure engineering team where they explain something about Azure, let's say Azure Web App or another service. Lots of blogs that I follow. And also, of course, Pluralsight you can use to stay up to date with Azure. And these are then the URLs that you can use for that. And I'll make sure to uh, send uh, the organizers um, the slides so that they can share them with you. Or I think this is also being recorded, right? And put on YouTube. So there you can also see it. Again, you can find me on Pluralsight. If you do not have access to Pluralsight, but you do want to use it, then you can send me a message on Twitter and I can send you a 30-day trial. So I have lots of uh, courses on Azure and I'm currently working on a course about cloud cost control, as in how to uh, monitor and also control the costs in the cloud. And that's uh, cloud agnostic. So it doesn't matter if you use Azure, AWS or Google. And again, check out my podcast. I'm very proud of this. <laughs> the Developer Weekly Podcast. Tomorrow, there's a new episode about keeping up with Azure with Tim Warner at this URL. All right. Let's see if there were any uh, questions. I can open up the chat to see if there's anything. I think pretty much everything's been answered at this point. Um, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmic your, un yourself, <laughs> unmute yourself, or you can throw them into the chat window as well. We'll keep monitoring that and you can just ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Barry, it's Hamza here. Hi. Uh, so going back to that uh, initial question that I had on uh, LTR and uh, block blob archive tier. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to figure out is whether there is a minimal charge per database on the LTR. So I've got the cost estimate uh, from, from the website. Uh, it's per GB and it works out really cheap as well. But what I'm unsure is whether there is a minimal charge, say for example, that you have around 200 odd databases that are uh, minute in size. If there is a minimum charge, it's gonna work out to be quite expensive, but if there isn't, it almost the same as the archive tier. Yeah, and I understand uh, the archive tier is like uh, cheaper, but obviously yeah. it's, it's slower. Whereas LTR is, uh, it, it's a background worker, so it doesn't affect the overall performance. Yeah. Uh, so I've gone back to Microsoft and uh, they've referred to a few specialists, but they haven't really concluded or given me a concise answer. So I'm just quite uh, interested in finding out, one, will there be a minimal charge? Two, what is the actual difference? Uh, so I haven't really heard about the archive tier until they told me about it recently. Yeah. Now, I don't know how they store it in, uh, in the background, as in uh, if they also put it on the archive tier, because I can imagine that they do, where, because I think the SLA is, uh, if you need uh, an LTR, it can take up to six hours, it take up to 12 hours or something, or something between two and 12 hours. So that's relatively slow, which uh, would tell me it would probably be on something like um, uh, archive tier. But as far as I know, there is no additional charge for LTR, as in it's only storage costs, so only uh, gigabytes there, which is relatively cheap. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I thought LTRs were charged, because we, we've set them up on some of our databases, and I remember seeing it comes up, and it's like 12 quid a month per database that you want to run your back. Yeah, pricing yeah, models so for some of this stuff is a bit crazy. So it's around yeah. 0 0.037 G, uh, pounds per GB per month is relatively cheap. Okay. Yeah, per, cool. per GB, yeah. But if there is actually uh, an additional cost, then it can become very uh, expensive. Especially where SQL itself can be very, very cheap. As in, I use a lot of SQLs that are just uh, five uh, euros per month or something. Or right. 
Um, we actually have a question in the chat. Uh, what are the considerations for Internet of Things workloads? Yeah, those are, that's a totally different uh, category. Um, let's see, top of my head, there are lots of things that you can um, do there. Uh, just to clarify, are you looking for options to host IoT workloads? As in host what? Because IoT is often, um, you would then look at uh, analytical services or things like uh, message uh, aggregators. So um, things like uh, event hubs, IoT hubs, stream analytics, those types of, uh, of things. But uh, in any case, um, there are lots of options to, uh, to host that type of stuff and to deal with many, many messages, which is something you typically do in IoT. And that's uh, a module of uh, the Azure What to Use When course on Plural site as well. And if you Google my name and Azure Friday, there will come up uh, a video where to ch uh, which, which is basically an excerpt of that, which, says, uh, which tells you how to choose services for dealing with messages. And that basically also deals with uh, Azure Event Hub and IoT hubs. So that might help. So Azure Friday video. No, let oh. me just. Uh... Uh, he said thanks. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? I kind of feel like it's last call at the bar. Last call, last call. <laughs> cool. Uh, I think we'll call that an evening then. Um, uh, thank you very, thank you very much for joining us um, and, and giving such a good talk.